Recording in progress. Well, uh, welcome everyone who's uh, here in person and those who are watching us at home or on different media to our council meeting. It's just an afternoon session today. Uh, and before we call the meeting to order, as always, we, with the new hybrid meetings that we have, we'll do an introduction on how the public can participate because that's always valuable to us. So are we going to start off with uh, our, our city clerk or, uh, or our assistant city manager? Are we doing our usual uh, city clerk introduction now? Yes. Yes. Okay. So. Hi. Let's hear from our super city clerk uh, first, please. Thank you. Good afternoon. The city of Monterey is committed to the safe public attendance of its public meetings. Masks are required for all who attend in person, regardless of vaccination status, except for those who are younger than two years old or have a medical condition that prevents wearing a mask. We ask attendees in the council chamber to keep their phones and devices muted to prevent audio interference and any feedback with the hybrid meeting. And uh, as we carefully return to more normal activities, uh, the City of Monterey seeks to continue to offer virtual methods for public participation. Governor Newsom's order remains in effect that allows us to have virtual meetings. If you're not here with us in person in the council chambers, you may join virtually by uh, by uh, participating in, in downloading or, uh, or uh, joining the Zoom Gov link that is listed on our website. You can also call into the meeting. To join on Zoom using your computer, smartphone, or telephone, please use the link or the phone number that's provided at isearchmonterey.org, and you'll find the agenda under the recent tab. To join by telephone, please dial toll-free 833-568-8864, and then enter the meeting ID, which is 160-772-9333 pound. And when you're prompted to enter a participant ID, press pound one more time. Detailed instructions on how to use Zoom is on our website at monterey.org forward slash public meetings. To make a public comment using the Zoom app, you can virtually raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. If you've dialed in by phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine and then unmute yourself again by dialing star six. You must do both. Public commenters will be muted until it's their turn to speak. I'll be calling on each public speaker in the order of their hands raised. We do ask that folks please stay within the time limit established for today's meeting, which we will show using a countdown timer on the screen. If you're connected live on Zoom, the timer is accurate with no delay. Today's meeting is also being streamed live on the city's YouTube account with a 10 second delay, and then also on Comcast channel 25, which has a 90 second delay. And as always, we look forward to receiving public comment today. Okay, and, and we, we thank you for those introductions. And that's a lot of detail, I know, but anyone who is watching this on Zoom, you can always get that information uh, from the agenda. So it is in writing for you. Because when you, you hear it, you're going, what? How do I keep track of all that? So it, we do have it for you. So let's uh, call the meeting to order and please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Yeah, I'm going to ask our super city clerk once again to uh, take the microphone and introduce our caring city council, please. Councilmember Albert. Here. Councilmember Hoffa. Here. Councilmember Smith. Here. Councilmember Williamson. He's on his way. Okay. And Mayor Roberson. Yes, I'm here as well. All right, let's go to public comments. And this allows members of the public to speak for a maximum of three minutes on any subject within the jurisdiction of the city of Monterey. But that's not on the agenda. If you wanted to talk about any of our agenda items, let us know. We'll pull them from consent and make sure you have an opportunity to talk. So if you'd like a response, sometimes people do, you can leave a contact now or you can just leave a contact at suggest at Monterey org and 
we can guarantee that you will get a very quick, rapid staff response. I don't, can't tell you how many times I hear from people about how quickly our outstanding staff gets back to them. One gentleman said he had worked for a government bureaucracy for years and he said, I couldn't believe it. I heard from, from the city of Monterey the same day, much less the day after. He said, that never happened in my bureaucracy. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll hear from us if you need anything. Uh, any public comment, not on the agenda from people who are present in our chambers? Okay, with that, back to our superb uh, assistant city manager. Mm -hmm. And we do have a few hands raised and the first uh, hand is from Jean Rash and welcome Jean. Hi, thank you. I just need to register my dismay and dis disappointment that the vision workshop that you folks had was not accessible online. Of course, the problem with this is that you are minus the valuable input of your most valuable resource, in my opinion, and that's the residents. And, you know, why is this oversight so problematic? Um, you know the reasons. I, I, I'm surprised we even have to talk about this. Number one, we're a suburb of Silicon Valley. Number two, we're really good at online communication. We've become experts with COVID. And COVID is still rampant. We, we need to have participation online for health reasons, for our residents who are other abled and for whom it's difficult to get to a location. We need it to reduce our carbon emissions. Uh, just all, all these really good reasons. And the irony of course, was not noticed that you were gathered at the Monterey Conference Center, touted as the standard, the epitome of conferencing. And it's just a glaring oversight that the public couldn't have an online connection. And I, I would really ask that it be the standard never really to have to be discussed again, that anything that had required a Brown Act notification be accessible online live and the good news the compliment that i'll give is the youtube contract that you have or however those things work is fabulous it's great to go back and retrieve meetings at any time 24 7 through youtube so congratulations on that thank you great thank you gene the uh, next <clears throat> Caller here is, uh, sorry, please bear with me for a moment. Uh, last three digits is 902. And uh, we also ask them to please unmute yourself. There we go. This is Nina Beatty. On August 13th, the DC Court of Appeals ruled against the FCC on its radio frequency radi radio radiation exposure guidelines, saying the commission failed to provide a reasoned explanation for the, its determination that its guidelines adequately protect against the harmful effects of exposure to our radio frequency radiation unrelated to cancer. And quote, that renders the order arbitrary and capricious. The court called the FCC's analysis of the material record cursory and insufficient as a matter of law. The court found that the FCC relied on conclusory and unexplained statements by the FDA and silence by other agencies instead of recent decision making and evaluating the evidence in the record. Exposure guidelines were last updated in 1996. The court said, we grant the petitions in part and remand to the commission to provide a reasoned explanation for its determination that its guidelines adequately protect against harmful effects of exposure to radio frequency radiation unrelated to cancer. It must in particular provide a reasoned explanation for its de decision to retain its testing procedures for determining whether cell phones and other portable electronic devices comply with its guidelines, address the impacts of RF radiation on children, the health implications of long-term exposure to RF radiation, the ubiquity of wireless devices and other technological developments that have occurred since the commission last updated its guidelines and address the impacts of RF radiation on the environment. 
the city bases its decisions on safety for cell tower applications and new higher levels of wireless radiation exposure from FirstNet on the premise FCC limits are protective of the public health, including allowing 100% emissions on the roofs above hotel patrons and senior citizens. But the commission, the court said the commission's failure to provide a reasoned explanation for its determination that exposure to RF radiation at levels below its current limits does not cause negative health effects unrelated to cancer renders inadequate the commission's explanation for its failure to discuss the implications of long-term exposure to RF radiation, exposure to RF pulsation or modulation, or the implications of technological developments that have occurred since 1996, including the ubiquity of wireless devices and Wi-Fi and the emergence of 5G technology. The court ruling puts the city on uncertain footing with no assurance of the public safety unless and until the FCC provides a reasoned decision per the remand. Any decisions by the city based on FCC guidelines could be argued to be arbitrary and capricious as well, especially since some of the evidence was also presented to the city. And the city risks possible catastrophic liability to itself using standards as undisputed, which are in fact now under review by a remand to cure by the courts. Therefore, I request the city suspend new wireless permits granted for FirstNet and other uses, halt construction on new and upgrade projects such as the Chomp, Park Lane, and Portola Plaza facilities, and put on hold wireless applications and permits. All right. Uh, sorry, but we, we, are, uh, we, we do have our timer, and uh, we're going to go to the next, uh, next caller here, and it's uh, 50 nine area code and we'll go ahead and uh, unmute them and let's uh, let's hear area code 509 yes good evening city council members lorna moffitt here and mayor um your dream now has come true where uh, recently it's my understanding you actually sued trying to stop a uh, cell tower uh, construction in some form and uh, now you have a chance to pause it um, you know, the FCC was form, what, the former CEO, the director of the FCC was Tom Wheeler. Tom Wheeler was the CEO of the telecoms communication. And he fired Dr. George Carlo when he hired George Carlo to find out whether cell phones were dangerous. And when Dr. George Carlo found out they were, he was fired by Tom Wheeler, who then became the FCC chairman, director, and who made those rules. And he was blindsided. He could not help himself because he was so overpowered by his position as a telecom communication director. And so we have to protect ourselves, and we have the right to do so. And you now have an out opportunity to do so. So please put that project on hold and wait for what the court finds out and do everything in your power to protect you, your loved ones, and all the city folks around. Thank you. Thank you, Lorna. And uh, let's see if we have anyone else. And uh, we have no other folks here online for public comment. Okay, as always, we appreciate that. And again, would encourage people, if uh, we don't have enough time to hear their entire presentation to, to send it to us, please, suggest at Monterey.org. And I received, I believe, four to five emails uh, with reference to the court ruling on AFCC guidelines. So we'll wanna take a look at that and see, see what that all means. And then I know that some of us have expressed uh, some concerns about our workshop, and we're going to make sure that next Friday it's accessible and everybody who wants to participate can certainly do so. So thank you for your uh, public input today. Mr. Raleigh came in late. Did you want to make a public comment not on the agenda? Okay. All right. Let's take a look then at the consent. Uh, was there anyone in the public who wanted to pull any consent items that we know of? I think we're aware of, no. And anyone here or online want to have uh, any of the consent pulled? Because consents are normally routine items. Uh, 
and uh, contracts, et cetera, things that uh, perhaps came back to the second, third, and fourth time after being worked on. So they're done as a group. So no one, then council, I, uh, council member Tyler. Um, I'll go ahead and, and move the consent agenda. Yes. I'm just hoping that we could get a staff report on number four. I don't I don't think we need, need to do it as a separate action. I'm just hoping that we could share that with the public a little bit more so they know what's going on there. Okay, do you wanna do it right now? Sure, that works. Okay, so why don't we uh, hold off on, we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll, we'll love to have your motion here uh, as soon as we have a brief overview of number four and that's to authorize a letter with respect to the League of Cities on local sales tax revenue. And so with that, we'll turn it over to our highly successful city manager, Hans Uslar. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Assistant City Manager, uh, Ned Rosana Satira will explain uh, the number four right now. So uh, I'll, I'll do my best to explain uh, this. Uh, it's uh, quite a, a complicated uh, shift uh, in the way that the Bradley Burns uh, sales tax uh, formula is uh, is developed by the state of California. Uh, the 1% local sales tax revenue that comes from online retailers is allocated to the jurisdiction from which the package uh, is shipped from, as opposed to going into a countywide pool. And uh, in the past, uh, the online retailers, when they, they typically went to a countywide pool, if the, uh, if the, online retailers ownership structure operates as a in-state online retailer as well as out out of state online retailers so uh, the, the kind of the long story short is that amazon among other uh, or or other uh, retailers for example that uh, have now uh, gone to operating their own warehouses versus uh, through a third party the revenue instead of going to a countywide pool uh, it essentially those funds are going now to the city where the fulfillment center is located, whether that be Tracy or Patterson or some of the other communities. And as a result, it means that uh, the majority of cities in the state of California are uh, are losing out on that uh, on that sales tax revenue to help support the services that we uh, that we rely on whether that be uh, police, public works, fire, parks, other types of services. So this, this type of practice, which is essentially an all or nothing approach where either it goes straight to, uh, straight to the county pool, which the city of Monterey would benefit from, or, or now in the case it goes straight to, uh, straight to the uh, cities or, or the unincorporated jurisdictions where the warehouses are located is what, many cities in California are calling a all or nothing practice. And this letter asks the League of California cities to begin a discussion statewide to talk about how that uh, sales tax split can be more fairly divvied up, uh, where uh, there is a benefit uh, for both the city where the fulfillment center is located, as well as funds going towards this county county pool which then gets divided up into the various jurisdictions within Monterey County. Uh, without uh, providing information that's, uh, that's too detailed and, and that's, uh, that's confidential, uh, we, there is a significant loss to the city of Monterey uh, since, uh, since when retailers uh, do in fact make this shift uh, and, and, and we have seen a, a loss in sales tax revenue. So uh, the hope is that council will support this uh, this this uh, action uh, this afternoon, and uh, that the League of California Cities will take will take action uh, on this as well, and, and begin discussions at the state level. Good, thanks, Nat. Mm -hmm. If I can, do you want to follow two, up? Please? Two questions. Mm -hmm. I'll ask them at the same time here. So I, I wonder how much this has to do uh, with uh, TOT tax for third party providers, how much that has to do with it. And also um, it, in a situation where the, uh, the distribution center is outside of the state, how does that work with this? Um, it sounds like it's more of a state thing, but how does it work if it's outside of the state? Yeah, if, if the, uh, in, in this case, the distribution centers are 
within operating within the state of California. So uh, Amazon, for example, is just and, and Wayfair. Uh, there's there's a number of others that have and operate warehouses in the state of California. So if they operate warehouses in the state of California, and it's owned and operated by that retailer, the sales taxes are now going to the fulfillment centers, the city where the fulfillment center is is located. Uh, where in previously, when it was operated by a third party. Uh, then the funds would go to the county pool. We would still receive sales tax, just not directly, just through, via via the county pool. Uh, we're strictly referring to sales tax. Uh, any type of third party operators, there's third party, uh, the uh, uh, hotel tax uh, vendors, Priceline, other other vendors, a completely separate issue. This is strictly relating to Bradley Burns, which is also known as sales tax. Thank you so much. Sure. Councilmember Ed, please. Yeah, if I could offer just a perspective of what happens if we um, act on this tonight, and I support it because I mm -hmm. think it's time for uh, the resolutions committee at the League California Cities uh, to bring this up. What will happen is it'll uh, there'll be several other cities that will respond. Uh, we will all write our letters of interest. The League would then start having subcommittee meetings and, and grind through some of the information, uh, testimony, and at some point might actually contact uh, a friendly legislator and then sponsor uh, future change to get it into the assembly of the Senate. And so it could, it could result in a change in legislation that would help support our efforts. So I think this is a good move for a good early first step uh, to get the process going. And League California Cities, I think is the, the best place to start it because all cities in the state of California uh, will have a, a shared interest. There may be some that are warehouse centric that will uh, not be in favor uh, but i think the majority mm -hmm. of the cities will will actually benefit from this being fair and equitable so i, I think uh, just a reminder that i served as councils uh, at the league california cities on the public safety subcommittee and we similarly take up action and then support and sponsor uh, bills and ultimately the assembly the senate and it gets to the governor the governor signs the bill so i think our voice needs to be heard mm -hmm. All right. There's no other comment. Uh, Should I try that motion again? Councilmember Tyler, you want to make a motion? <laughs> motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. Okay. And was there any public comment on uh, the one that we discussed at all? No online public comment. Okay. And anyone here? Okay. Roll call, please. Uh, Councilmember Albert. Yes. Councilmember Hoffa. Yes. Councilmember Smith. Yes. Councilmember Williamson. Yes. And Mayor Roberson. Uh, yes, for me as well. All right, we'll go to our public hearing, which is an ordinance adopting the first amended development agreement on Del Monte Beach community project. So I'll again turn to our, our successful city manager. I think he's going to introduce our community development director. Yeah. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this is about uh, uh, a suggested uh, first amended development agreement for the Monte Beach Community Project. That is a pretty um, a long time project that, that has yeah. developed at, at that site. And uh, I think we came up with a good solution. Um, and with that, I punted over to our community development director, Kimberly Cole. What I would ask, is there anyone in the audience who wanted to speak on this one after the presentation? Do we know if we have any uh, people queuing for online? Okay. Jamie, no? Uh -uh. You're in CIP, I bet. Okay. Oh, you're going to speak on that one too. Good. No, okay. And uh, do we have anyone that we know of yet? Not that we know of uh, okay. on this item. There, there were two raised hands in Zoom. Oh, there are okay two raise hands okay excellent okay good to know all right uh we're we've got our our superior um community development director is going to give us an overview of something that i remember fondly from 40 almost 40 years ago <laughs> and i do appreciate the summary by the way that you had in the report of, um, that was when I can remember the, the night that we actually did the subdivision, uh, Mr. Brahm and Mr. Cass mm -hmm. actually came forward and 
and it was uh, a celebration that uh, many that you don't normally see on land use, right? Great. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, this afternoon, um, you'll be considering to introduce by title only and waive the full reading and pass a first reading of an ordinance adopting the first amended development agreement agreement for the Del Monte Beach community. I have just a couple slides to share some background with you. Um, in 2001, the council approved resubdivision of many substandard residential lots and commercial lots into standard residential lots. And basically the development agreement that um, cemented that um, subdivision expires on January 17th, 2022. So the expir uh, expiration date is imminent. Out of all the development, three lots remain undeveloped, 20 and 22 Spray and 205 Dunecrest Lane. And in anticipation of this, um, the owners of 20 and 22 Spray um, uh, submitted an application and applied for an amended development agreement, extending sort of those terms until 2029. And the owner of 205 Dunecrest Lane has not yet applied. And so just a brief history, mm -hmm. um, I think what's interesting, mm -hmm. if you look at the green square here and you compare it with the original subdivision map, there were um, sort of in this upper area here, there was about 48 lots. So we could have seen 48 new homes in that area based under the original subdivision. And due to opportunity buying by the city and the park district and coming together, there was ultimately community consensus reached to merge all those lots and resubdivide them from something like 45, 48 lots um, into 11 lots. And those are roughly um, these lots that we see um, on the screen off of Spray Avenue. In addition to that, there were sort of two parts. There were, I believe, about 12 lots, some of them commercial extending down um, closer to Del Monte Avenue that um, were resubdivided into three residential lots. And that's where we see 205 Dunecrest Lane is, is up here, this vacant lot. So this afternoon, you're only gonna be considering an amended development agreement for 20 and 22 spray. One of the key challenges um, that's slightly changed over the years is that it's come to our attention that the Coastal Commission may not issue permits or waivers in the immediate future due to the cease and desist order. So that's really a need for these, um, the property owners at 20 and 22 spray to obtain an amended development agreement. And th this is the location of the two lots on spray that have yet to be developed, 20 and 22 spray. All the other homes have been constructed. The first step in this process as required um, under our municipal code and state law is for the planning commission to hold a public hearing and find the proposed development agreement consistent with the city of Monterey general plan. The general plan designates these properties for low density residential, the zonings are one, and the planning commission has determined that the project, this two single family homes are consistent with this low density designation. So what are the terms of the development agreement? We're basically holding everything that's in the existing development agreement, but extending it to January 17th, 2029. And there's a real advantage to the community. That development agreement included um, restrictive development standards. So the community could anticipate and pres uh, preserve their views. And this project will continue those development standards that were included in the development agreement, which includes a height limitation of 16 feet and one story. And as you know, on most of our residential lots, the requirement is two stories and 25 feet. So this continues um, what was agreed to 20 years ago. As part of development agreements, um, cities are able to negotiate um, for terms and the city um, negotiated that the water that had been designated for these sites all the years ago that the city would obtain for these two lots $72,000 um, that ultimate for housing and ultimately our city council can decide how they want to spend that money. And then also a contribution so we can finish our local coastal program of $50,000. 
The applicants are also covering the time of our attorney to prepare the development agreement. And I believe that's about it. So with that, we're recommending that you take this action this afternoon on the development agreement. And I'm happy to answer any questions. I believe um, John Bridges, the applicant's attorney and the Hongs might also be on the telephone. Right, good. Uh, council questions? Council member uh, Smith, we'll start with Ed. Oh, thank you. Um, just curious about what happens with 205 Dunecrest if they're not included, are we faced with having to amend this in the future if they were to step forward? So we've reached out to the owner of 205 Dunecrest and um, have given them the opportunity and suggested that they file an application with the city so we could offer the same terms to that property owner. I know um, the property owners considering that as well as other options. So hmm. um, it, the, the challenge before us is in order to get an ordinance adopted, there's required by law, a public hearing in front of the planning commission and two for the city council to adopt a, an ordinance. So we're, you know, as we're approaching the end of the year here, we have some time, but not a lot of time to make that happen. So I know I spoke to the property owner today and um, just reminding them about this public hearing as well as I reminded them about the planning commission hearing as well. Okay, and, and there is a time that would expire and they're aware of the fact that th theirs could expire. Yes, I've so the development agreement expires on January 17th, 2022. Um, I've both verbally and in writing discussed that or shared that with the owner of 205 Dunecrest. Great, thank you. That's all the questions sure. I have. Yeah. Council Member Tyler? Just to kind of follow up with that. So if, if it does lapse, they have to start from scratch pretty much. We're not going to be able to pull over what was provided in the in the agreement prior or how does how would that work? So I, I guess I can share this now with you. Um, the agreement says it expires uh, in January of 2022. The most secure method to, for both parties to move forward is to actually amend the development agreement. Um, if there is other maturations that come out of those discussions, I think we'll evaluate each one with our legal counsel and review those options. Okay, perfect. And then just one uh, other uh, different question. Um, I saw the, I can't, can't remember what it was off the top, 70 some odd thousand for the affordable housing. How is that dollar figure? Um, how, did, how did we come up with that? Yeah, figure? so um, we were looking for some basis. So we the most recent was the city of Pacific Grove created a, a fee for water so that you know people can purchase it for new development. So we took that and prorated it for two single family for the amount of acre feet for the two single family houses. Okay. All right. Thank and you. the applicants have agreed to that amount. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Any no other questions? And we'll have uh, anyone here in, in the chambers wanted to speak on this. Nope. nope. <laughs> it turned green. That's all I know. <laughs> oh, your time's up. <laughs> oh, that's the button. Now it's your okay. turn. We'd love to hear from you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Hello and welcome. Thank you. I'm Carol Frederick. Some of you may know me. Oh, yeah. Me. Yeah. I won't say from way back. Oops, I just said it. It is way back <laughs> because when you talk about this project, yeah. I was there in 20, uh, no, 2002. Yeah. And have babysat it for a very long time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. My question is, I've been, I'm being told that there is no, um, there is no way to obtain a, um, a, a um, God, what am I trying to think of? For the Coastal Commission to give us the uh, permit. So if the Coastal Commission is not going to give us a permit after we go through all the rest of this stuff and pay all this money, what are we doing it for? Because you're telling the people in the in the city are telling me that if you don't have the coastal permit, then you're not going to you're not going to get all the rest of this. You're not going to be able to build. You're not going to have water. You're not going to have it. You have to have the coastal permit. So you need to tell me what are we doing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> How are we sure. solving this? Right. OK, good. We'll get an answer for you, Carol, here when we're done with the public okay. comment. OK, thank you. And online input, please. Yes, we have uh, some online input and uh, we'll first take the feedback from, uh, it's listed here as rural. 
V-E-R-L? Yes, hello. Hello, hi there. Hi. Uh, yeah, so uh, my name is Val Satanandan, and uh, I'm, in I'm attending on behalf of my mother-in-law, Chi Huang, who owns the property. Um, so I just wanted to thank all those involved for taking the time to work on and review uh, the proposed development agreement. And I think our lawyer, John Bridges, uh, who's been representing us in this agreement, uh, is also on the call and uh, will want to say a few words. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, we will reset the timer here and uh, one moment while I re reorient myself here. Okay, on to uh, John Bridges. Welcome, John. Yes, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Um, John Bridges on behalf of the applicant. And I primarily wanted to thank um, staff, uh, in, in particular, um, Mr. Uslar and uh, Kim, of course, and your special counsel, Adam Lindgren. I've been practicing land use for a long time. I remember long ago when Mr. Roberson, you were mayor, many, many moons ago. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say that your staff has um, just exceeded abundantly and beyond um, expectations. They've done a spectacular job in helping us to understand the history uh, associated with this matter. And they've been just very um, professional in, in working this through. Their presentation to the Planning Commission was extremely detailed, uh, resulting in a unanimous Planning Commission recommendation. We're grateful for that as well. And I just wanted to make myself available in the event that you had questions for us that we might be able to respond to. And again, thank you all. Great. Thank you, John. And we have no additional public comment online here. Mr. Mayor, back to you. All right. Then I'll close the... Uh public comment part of the hearing and um, Ms. Erickson asked really the a core question why are we doing this if uh, there's no guarantee of water or permit from the Coastal Commission and you know, it looks like our community development director Kim Cole is going to help us with that pretty basic question isn't it <laughs> um so Ms. Fredrickson uh, uh Frederick owns um 205 Dune Crest and so I know she's mulling through trying to understand the development agreement. So what this action does is it gives the owners of 20 and 22 spray eight additional years to obtain that coastal permit. And um, in exchange for the terms that I shared with you. So it gives extra time, it gives them certainty about the city's expectation and it reserves our water. Well, the subdivision, when we went from 48 lots down to 11, <clears throat> There was a lot of negotiation there. There was a lot of um, expectations for that re reduced development. So um, this continues the existing water reservation for those two properties and removes the uncertainty um, for this development. So, okay, if it, if it goes to Coastal Commission, because part of your report was it goes to the Coastal Commission. So they would, if they give an approval here, and there is water allocated to these lots then? There right? is. So this is the okay. difference between the cease and desist Got order it. and water allocation. <laughs> Got it. So that, theoretically, it's not under the cease and desist order because it's already allocated. No, um, no, I think what the Coastal Commission is looking at is to initiate conversations with the State Water Resources Control Board that even without, even with the water allocation, that um, there's no intensification of use. So they're trying to understand that clause of the cease and desist order. And um, I understand conversations are pending with the state. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I guess what I can share with you, it's not absolutely known even with the water allocation if they're going to obtain their coastal permit. And this is a change that, um, that's occurred in the past year yes. um, over the past, I guess, you know, 19 years of the development agreement where they were able to obtain their their um, permits. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, anytime you're dealing with one state agency and much less two, it gets very complicated. And they can all often be at, uh, at counterpoints with one another too. Yeah, it drives a lot of us crazy. Okay. 
Probably not a perfect answer, but that's the way it is, right? <laughs> um, back to the council. Are we ready to move on it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, second. If there's no other discussion. We'll go to roll call. Council Member Hoffa. You're muted, Alan. Okay, yes. <laughs> Councilmember Williamson? Yes. Councilmember Albert? Yes. Councilmember Smith? Yes. And Mayor Roberson? And yes. So that carries 5 0. Thanks for being here on that. And we're going to go to uh, our NCIP program manual. Uh, last time that we discussed this, I gave a little bit of the history and so on. I don't think I, I need to do this, but I think wisely the, the council wanted to wait a month on this, get some input from the public, which we had. Uh, I think in general, I, I would say the manual was generally accepted, but there were some good suggestions that were passed by our staff. I know our staff had meetings with people and responded to various questions that were raised. And so with that, uh, are we gonna go to, Hans, Mr. Witchery gonna do this or was, will it be our Supreme City Attorney? No, it, uh, it will be our Supreme Public Works Director. Okay. <laughs> then the City Attorney will have to wait for her uh, adjective later. <laughs> so uh, the Supreme <laughs> Public Works Director. Uh, <laughs> nice haircut too. Oh, I thank you very much. When I hear Supreme, I always think of pizza being close to dinner time. So I apologize for, <laughs> for having that uh, that wandering thought there. You know, squirrel. We, uh, Steve, um, we have a rule here. We don't talk about pizza at dinner time because Alan is listening. <laughs> <laughs> Forgot that one. Thank you for that. Appreciate that. Don't yes, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> this item is back again after about a month. We, we uh, uh, took it under consideration and, and we actually sent out the manual to all the um, NCIP um, uh, representatives, as well as the neighborhood um, association presidents in order to just listen some feedback. As Mr. Mayor pointed out, uh, we did uh, have some conversations with a few of those folks and we've adopted or, or we changed uh, some, some text in that to kind of meet those needs of those who are responding to it. Uh, what I'd you know, ask today is that perhaps we hear some more public comment from folks who might be out there uh, on the manual itself. And then if we could you know, come to some agreement and move forward, this would be a great thing to help us uh, set the table for the NCAP going into the future. Okay, I, th I, th I think that's a good overview. So unless there are council questions, why don't we go ahead to uh, public comment? We'll again, we'll start with the folks who are here. We very much would value any input that, if, that you wanna share in the NCIP. Manual? No? And, okay. It doesn't look like uh, we have any public comment at this point. Or do we have anything online? We do have uh, one hand raised so far, and that's from Jean Rash. Welcome back, Jean. Always happy to hear from Jean. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the extra time the council allocated, and I appreciate the time that the director of uh, uh, public works and the city attorney put in. And we had some nice revisions that are, are totally acceptable and include the uh, NCIP commission in uh, discussions of future changes and any deappropriations, uh, we'd be included in discussions. So that was uh, the main impetus and I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. All right. Great, thank you, Jean. We have no other public comment. And no comment here. So uh, I'll close the... Uh public comment, and it'd be my honor to make a motion to uh, approve the uh, recommendation. A second. Second. Okay, any discussion? I think the fact that we took the time was good and that we people understand it. And so I'm going to just thank everyone who has uh, given their, their input on this. And also with the understanding, if something doesn't work, Change it. You can do that. And you don't have to come to the council to do that. So make sure it works for you because I've been to a numerous meetings and I know it's pretty complicated. You've worked out a really good system. 
so I compliment you that. And again, our staff for being so open and pointing out what we can do, what we can't do, the legal ramifications. Roll call, please. Uh, let's see, Councilmember Williamson. Yes. Councilmember Hoffa. Yes. Councilmember Smith. Yes. Councilmember Albert. Yes. And Mayor Roberson. Yes, that passes 5 0. Did we have a second? Yes. Right up. Thank you. We have two seconds. Two seconds. All right, two seconds. <laughs> That's why we. <laughs> <laughs> Council comments. Uh, Let's let's go online first with uh, Council Member Allen. Any count, council comments this afternoon? Meetings and outside activities? And... No, I don't have any comments. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Member Dan. Yes, I do have one comment. I attended the Monterey Peninsula Chamber of Commerce Business Excellent Awards to fourth annual awards. Your mic, mic, your mic on, please, Dan. Oh, Shall I start again? Yes, <laughs> yes, okay. So I attended the Monterey Peninsula Chamber of Commerce uh, Business Excellent Awards, the 35th or 34th annual, and the city of Monterey, very proud to announce the city of Monterey received the Government Public Utilities and Transportation Award. Um, congratulations to the staff. And that was a, a lot of hard work, I'm sure. And um, we are the best city in the, on the peninsula and we should get this award every year. <laughs> So congratulations, that's it. Thanks for being there. Council Member Tyler. Yeah, so uh, with Monterey One, mm. uh, for, for folks that are paying attention or not, I will, I, I'll try to um, distill the, the current conversation down a little bit. So um, as, as most folks are aware, um, we were, Monterey One was moving forward with the water purchase agreement between the water management district, which mm -hmm. our, our mayor sits on, um, and Calam for the expansion of the Pure Water Monterey project. Um, and so things got a little bit held up with a particular clause um, in, the, in the water purchase agreement um, that focused on a requirement for both of the public agencies involved in the water purchase agreement to support Calam, um, Calam's uh, desalination project um, if for whatever reason, the uh, agreements, uh, the, the water level agreements that are identified in the water purchase agreement aren't met. And so um, it came out to be that that was illegal, it, it's not binding. And so um, the negotiators had to go back to the negotiating table and, and continue having that conversation. And you might have more follow up, I, I'm not sure where it left off with the water management district. The last that I heard it was going to um, be on the water management district's agenda. Um, and then it's gonna be coming back to us for a special meeting whenever that's uh, kind of uh, distilled out. But um, I'll, I'll just kind of end with that. My hope is, is that we find a way of resolving this as soon as possible so that we can move forward because this is a big key for us to um, move beyond the cease and desist order and then continue these water conversations from there, um, which are, are by far not over, but I'm excited to get this over mm -hmm. with and, and, and sealed. So that's it for me. That's excellent. Thank you for your work on that. Council Member Ed. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I, I wanna just go back and say uh, a comment or two on the NCIP. I was thinking about you know, what that has meant uh, to the city of Monterey. Thank you, Mayor. and. Richard Rochello and Rick Hoyer and others that worked so hard in 1985 to make that work. And uh, in my neighborhood and throughout the city, I could rattle off 20 or 30, just from memory, uh, the improved projects that have made such a, an impact in the neighborhood. So a program that has endured, and that is so rare in government to have uh, a program, but this really isn't government. This is really collaboration and community um, at, at its best and what a great model. And I'm frequently asked by other city council members, League of California cities, when we talk about Monterey, they all wanna know how that works so well in partnership with, uh, with our residents. So kudos to those that have made sure it's an enduring program. Um, I wanna congratulate Chris Summers, uh, who is the new onboard uh, chair of the Monterey County Convention Visitors Bureau. Uh, John Turner uh, served in a difficult year as the chair, 
And that, uh, that board has representatives from every city and the county uh, with the interests of promoting uh, conventions and uh, now a little bit of tourism as we rebound. So uh, attended the annual uh, luncheon. Um, I guess that was Thursday, I think. Uh, but nice event, good to see everybody there. So uh, we've launched off into another year with some uh, campaign and information and more to follow on that as the uh, videos and marketing uh, will be released that are uh, tailored for the appropriate response and the right uh, visitor uh, that is uh, not gonna overcrowd Monterey, but um, more of the right type of visitors is what we're after. Um, also great news to all of our public safety partners, um, law enforcement and fire, uh, South Lake Tahoe uh, dodged a big one. Mm. Uh, it's slowly gaining uh, under better control. Uh, my friends in El Dorado County uh, that I know many and had lots of phone calls with, um, some lost cabins, homes, damages, but they've all been working for like the last 35 days nonstop. So kudos to them and kudos to the public safety partners of the Dixie Fire as well. That's gaining some containment and looking better. Uh, they'll be fighting that for many more weeks. Uh, but those two large fires have reached the point where we can say, great job, keep it up. And uh, the containment is getting to the point where it's a little more comfortable. Um, so thank you for all the hard work from public safety. I know we had our firefighters attended. We also had law enforcement that was responding to both those fires in, in full support of uh, Northern California cities and counties. So great job. And we hope we can get through the rest of this fire season with um, not having as many of those big fires. Yeah, really. But thanks for that. That's very, very important appreciation. Yep. yep. That's all. Agree that, yeah. And to just follow up a tiny bit on uh, Council Member Tyler's comments, the I expect the water management district will come to uh, an agreement on the water, the, the water purchase agreement, because it's to the best interest of everybody and we need the water. And so we'll, we'll see how our uh, next meeting goes. And the um, fact that Monterey One Water is, uh, is a board and has signed it or will be we haven't, we're we so, waiting until they come back to us. Got it, right. It's negotiations and we know how much fun those are. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, I wanted to just a brief update. I wanted to compliment uh, Senator Laird's office and his staff who have put together a, a, a working task force with respect to illegal camp, encampments on Caltrans right-of-ways which uh, in, it was an, in agreement at our meeting that it's unhealthy and safe for the inhabitants as well as everyone else around. And so th through that office, we were able to have uh, at the table uh, representatives from Caltrans, Department of Transportation, and CHP, which is uh, really the people that have, have to make it happen and do the cleanup. Our chief was there along with some of his staff and they were excellent and offered the partnership and the collaboration that's necessary to make this happen. So we're gonna be meeting again and there's a possibility we'll ha actually have a standing meeting, perhaps monthly where we can continue to work on this because we've all of us heard from our constituents. And, and I think there's a recognition that something absolutely needs to be done and so much is outside of the city's ability to do but the offer from our city staff, I don't think our city matters was online. So they gave away the store, uh, <laughs> but it was, we're gonna do what we can do to help because Caltrans and CHP said they're absolutely overloaded and understaffed. And, and right, it sounds familiar. So I wanted to let everybody know we're actively pursuing solutions in that area. So with that we will momentarily uh, after we'll have city manager reports and we'll see if there's anyone who wanted to talk about closed session then we'll adjourn to that okay so city manager i have no reports today okay and there's anyone online in the audience who wanted to discuss uh, anything on the closed session nope we've had the chiron up for several minutes now and no uh, raised hands for closed session 
Thank you. All right. Well, once again, I'll th I want to thank the public for their input, City Council, our fantastic staff for having a really another good productive meeting. We'll adjourn to closed session. Take care of yourself, Tom. <laughs>